you are uh, living by the coast or exposed to the coast and the sea, even the picture behind you, <laughs> which is coastal. Ta -da. Um, <laughs> ah, what I prepared earlier. Um, um, that, that, that's really good for us. Welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Activia. Folks, what is aging? How is our biological age different from our chronological age? And what are the scientific jumps being made in the study of aging? Well, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Regis Professor Roseanne Kenny, head of the Aging Research Program at Trinity College. Roseanne, welcome back to the show. How's it going? Thank you very much. Very well, thank you. Well, before we chat aging and all things health, talk to me about Regis, Regis Professor. What, the, what does that mean now? What is it? It's an honorary title. Um, it's made uh, not consecutive, consecutively, it's just intermittent. I'm the first female. It was awarded by George I um, initially in the early 1600s in Trinity. And in the last uh, 400 years, there have been 24 Regis uh, positions. Um, and it's in medicine this particular one that I have. There are 24 in medicine. It's Regis Professor in Physic, and Physic was the old word for medicine, like physical health, yeah. et cetera. Wow. Let's get stuck into it. Aging, what is it? Let's begin there, because people listening in, we're all getting a little bit older. I'm 42 now. I feel a bit older some days. Uh, aging is part of life. What is it exactly? Yeah, well, first of all, you, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head as part of life. It's a process and it's a wear and tear process. And basically, the trillions of cells that we have in our body are, are very, very active all of the time, producing energy and then getting rid of byproducts from energy. That takes a lot of effort for cells and also reproducing themselves. And um, so up until maybe your 40s, possibly early 30s, that's pretty much in harmony and balance. And then it starts to get out of sync a little bit. Um, and, and all of the bits of the cells aren't functioning as well and as perfectly as they were previously. Um, and that's when the aging process starts to kick in. Now, the good news is that with respect to the process of aging and that wear and tear, the, we, the, only 20% is down to our genes. So only 20% of when the process starts and the, the speed of the process is genetic. The rest, 80%, and we know this from very good twin studies, is environmental. That's kind of a, the overarching term for it. But what it means is, is within our control. It's things that we know can manipulate the process and make a difference to the process. So that's really good news. And the other, I suppose, bit of good news is that those changes that we can make if we need to make them, or those factors which govern aging that we have control over, actually, they work at any stage in life. So I was um, reading some recent research on lifelong cyclists, intense cyclists, and how slow their aging process is. They have a very decelerated aging process when they've continued right through into their 70s and 80s cycling, but we're always intense cyclists. Well, that's all very well knowing that. It's very interesting, but it's of no use to someone who's 60 who's, or 50 who's listening who was not a lifelong cyclist. So um, the, I, we can change those environmental factors at any stage in life and have an impact with respect to that change on the process of aging in ourselves. Yeah, so it's it's never too late to make a change. It's never too late to slow down the rate of aging and to, to improve your body and give yourself the best chance of age, aging gracefully and successfully. But un unquestionably, the earlier we start, the better. And the more consistent, the better. And are we finding that people are aging faster as we get more sedentary as a society or as society changes? Is there any research around that to say that actually we're aging kind of faster now than we used to say 10 years ago or 20 years ago or not? We're not aging faster. We're probably aging more slowly. Like today's 60 year old, the common parlance is today's 60 year old is actually yesterday's 50 year old. Um, and, and I think that's 
for a number of different reasons. Uh, it, it, because we are aging, I think what you mean is we are continuing to age mm -hmm. at a population level, and that is true. Every 10 years, um, we we age by two, we 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 get older by 2.2 years. So every decade we're living longer. That's certainly the case. But but in to many, to many, every every decade we're living longer, but we're actually biologically younger than the previous than previously. Um, and that's because of awareness of all of these things I'm talking about to, to some extent. Um, and then there are factors maybe involved in that that we, we, we're not familiar with. We actually don't know why it is the case. Um, now, in some countries, the USA and the UK particularly, that, that um, increasing um, longevity is actually changing and it's slowing down a little bit. Um, and that mostly is because of socioeconomic issues, poverty, basically. Um, and also in the States, early deaths, deaths of young people from opioid toxicity, drug addiction and problems. So, so it is changing a little bit. And we're wondering, actually, as a, in a, a researching community, is there a possibility also that it might be changing because of processed foods and ultra processed foods? Because the accumulation of those toxic toxic, they are toxic, food products is becoming much, much more, more common. Um, in, in England, 91% of a diet of a 10-year-old is ultra-processed or processed. 91%. 57% of a diet of a 60-year-old is processed or ultra-processed. Wow. And in terms of the, the ultra processed foods, is it the additives? Is it the the creation or the or, or, or the you know the process of, of how they're made that is yeah, a problem? Both. Yeah. Yeah, it's both of those things. You what what you do is you actually use very few constituents, as you'll know, Carl, with ultra processed foods. You take those few constituents and you you re you repurpose them. You use chemical processes and other processes to use the chemicals within those limited um, food uh, products and change them completely so that something can become a tofu mince, <laughs> which which was actually just, you know, a, a wheat or, or something earlier. So you, you change the, the actual constituency of them. And, and of course, there are uh, additives and preservatives um, uh, to maintain shelf life. So from a, di from a dietary perspective, what we're saying to people is eat Real food, uh, cook from scratch more, put it back to how it was in the 50s and 60s, basically. Two very simple rules of thumb, which I like about this, and which I use myself. If you don't have it in the kitchen, if you see it in, in packaging, uh, you look at the, what's written in the packaging, and you don't recognize one of the constituents on the packaging, and you don't have it in your kitchen, it's not something you use commonly, that's ultra processed. The other thing is, generally speaking, if foods are, are packaged, they're processed because it means it's a shelf life issue. They have to have something in them to maintain shelf life. So fresh, as much as possible, fresh foods. Okay, great. I love that. Chat to me about the environment then aspect. So we looked at food. We know ultra processed foods are poor in terms of aging. The environmental aspect of our lives hugely important with regards to aging, one would imagine. This is a great question. And we've looked at this in our own study, in the TILDA study, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. So if overall, we looked at nature and exposure to nature. And nature exposure is categorized in two ways, green exposure, green space, and blue exposure. Both of them are very good, very good for mental health and cognitive processing and physical health. But blue uh, pips green. Uh, in all of the components we've looked at. So if you are uh, living by the coast or exposed to the coast and the sea, even the picture behind you, <laughs> which is coastal, um, <laughs> ah, it's what I prepared earlier, um, um, that, that, that's really good for us. And it seems to attenuate, to dumb down the inflammatory, the chronic inflammatory process that we know is one of the triggers for, for aging and for physical um, age problems, as well as brain health problems. So water is good. Now, you might say, well, why would that be? Green is good. Yes, water is even better. Um, so what, why would that be? And, and obviously, nature 
stimulates us mm -hmm. and it stimulates our minds. Um, uh, but but the brain is very closely aligned with the autonomic nervous system and all of the other cell, uh, which which feeds into the cells and organs in the body. So if we if we de-stress our minds or alleviate um, stress from the mind by 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 teasing it with pleasurable variety, which is what the sea does and what nature generally does, then that has an overall beneficial effect on mind and on on body. We think that's one of the main reasons for it. Also, if you're by the sea, very often people are more active, physically active, walking, etc. But but even if you take all of those factors into consideration, there's something independent with respect to water exposure. And it's probably variety, because variety matters as we get older. And does that apply to cities? So on my way up to today, I walked here from Houston Station. I followed the Liffey pretty much right the way up. Does that is that going to improve my health by being wa walking beside the Liffey, beside rivers? The fact that it's just water, it's going to make me age better. Yeah, I mean, you'll get the variety component from that. And, you know, and if you, you know it yourself, if you felt better and refreshed and there was something that you could identify with that walk, which was better than it, it just being surrounded by traffic on your way from Houston. <laughs> um, you, 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 you know the feeling yourself. Yeah. So, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, it's not as good because obviously you're still being exposed to uh, toxic air uh, from the vehicles which are passing. It's good. Yeah, it's but good. for those you know, for those living in cities and or working in cities, if they can get down yeah. to see a canal, a river, with if, with some trees generally planted alongside it, you're doing pretty well. If you even if you're getting to like I'm, in West Cork, we're spoiled. We've loads of beaches on our doorstep, and they're beautiful. But for those listening in here, we're in cities, canals, rivers, uh, Grand Canal Dock, the docks, anywhere where there's water, get yourself to it at least once a day, and you know, just you're going to be healthier if you do. Absolutely. And, and now councils and other uh, local authorities are recognizing the value of nature and green spaces. And you'll notice that they're cultivating green spaces much more for, 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 for that sort of exposure. So, so it's, it's very important. Yeah. Talk to me about genetics and aging then. So that's, is that an old wives tale or is it true that, oh, my, you know, my parents aged really well. I'm going to age very well. The, presumably the, the genetic component is very important. It has to be. It, okay, I, so genetics contribute to 20% of the process. The rest is environmental. Mm -hmm. Now, we can do nothing about our genes. We have, you know, 20 to 30,000 fixed genes. We cannot, at the moment, influence them. We can, interestingly, from my perspective as a researcher, influence animals' genes and modify them and change change animals' genes. For example, C. elegans is, 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 a, is a worm tiny, tiny worm, and um, the size of a comma on an A4 sheet. And by changing the temperature that that worm is growing in, by just a few degrees, we can double its lifespan right. through modification of a DAF2 gene. And we hold DAF2 genes as well. And there are some groups, um, some Jewish uh, cohorts particularly, who have, who have modified DAF2 genes and do live much longer than would be expected without. So, so we can modify genes, but not in humans at the moment. That would, is just not, for many reasons, not acceptable ethically. But the environmental thing, with the environmental stuff that I'm talking about, we, we, what we do is we change epigenetics. Mm -hmm. That's the um, clock. And what epigenetics are, we've got CPG sites and um, uh, they're, they're methylated sites on our genes. We have 28 million sites overall, and a third of them change with aging. But there's about a thousand of them that are really key and we can measure. And by measuring those, and there's very good systems for doing this now, we can more or less tell what somebody's biological age is. And that's probably what you're thinking of. That's epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Now, and epigenetics is dynamic. Our genes are fixed, but our epigenetics are changing all of the time. So if you start cold water swimming in Westport, White Strand, or if you start um, walking briskly for an hour a day or, or strengthening um, muscle strengthening exercise programs, change your diet to a Mediterranean plus diet, which is Mediterranean with a focus on microbiome, etc. All of those behavioral changes 
influence the epigenetics, these important sites, and dynamically changes them so that they are functioning much better. And they function by giving instructions to the cells on how to produce energy. So that's why you start feeling more energetic, less fatigued, in better form, and your body is functioning better. And all of the diseases that we associate with aging are also a consequence of sluggishness in our epigenetic systems. So if we, if we tune them up, then those systems function better, our heart, our gut, etc. Talk to me about transfusions then and how they might affect aging. I'm intrigued by this. I think this is really interesting. Uh, this, of, 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 of the sort of uh, blood being transfused into the body, being a younger blood than your own blood and the difference that this may have on your age. It's a fascinating concept. It is. No, it's more than a concept. So in, in mice experiments, giving blood of young mice into older mice actually changes the epigenetics of, of older mice, but also changes their performance. So, um, so it does work at, at that animal level. Um, now, there are not sufficient human studies to confirm whether or not it would make a difference as yet in humans, but there seems to be something in the cells, and we think it's in the immune system cells that you're, that you're transferring into the older animal that um, allows the animal to deal much better with dead cells, something that's not good for us to have and is a marker of aging when we, when we look at the, an aging person and aging blood are what's called senescent cells. They're cells that have got very old and are circulating in the system. And, and they actually, in, when they're circulating, our systems don't like the fact that they're around the place and try to do something to mitigate that. But the processes that are involved in that are actually quite toxic to us. So it's so the fewer senescent cells you produce and have circulating, the better. And certainly we think that with the, the blood from younger mice, that there are factors in that blood that can quickly get rid of senescent cells and also um, make it less likely that vibrant cells turn into senescent cells. So could that be a thing in the future that we see that you'll, you'll yeah. check you'll check in to, to, to for your anti-aging and they will literally do a bro blood transfusion with younger blood okay. and you'll come out and be and feel younger. It's already happening in the um, in California, etc. And um, although the evidence isn't sufficiently strong enough um, to to for this to be more widespread, but individuals are having transfusions. Um, in in some in some cultures, I I have never had a transfusion myself. I was just about to ask you that question. You do look you do look very young though on the screen. I'll give you Thank that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But 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 um but I I actually do think that that is something for the future. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Well, wow. but people love the idea of kind of it's easy almost, isn't it? You go in, you plug in, the blood comes in, you go out. There's no effort involved in that particularly. That 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 concept rings true with, with regards to aging as well as exercise. Absolutely. Now, of course, what we don't know is how long it's going to last. Mm -hmm. You know, circulating cells, each of them a very finite um, um, lifespan, etc. Some of them only a number of hours. So, you know, there are lots of there are lots of different. Um, issues with respect to that, but but it is it is it's 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 very interesting and it's very likely that that will be something that we'll all be doing. But something that we we that, that there has been re since I last met you, you um, um, research on um, which which has shown uh, a benefit. Our randomized control trials, kind of kind of taking the environmental factors that we've talked about and using the clock as an outcome. What do I mean by that? So taking things like dietary changes, caloric restriction, for example, coupled with omega-3s and zinc and vitamin C, D, and E. And they also used um, physical activity programs, microbiome-friendly uh, diet, probiotics and prebiotics. And, uh, and actually, they gave fecal uh, microbi microbiota transplants. And, and then pharmacological uh, interventions like rapamycin and resveratrol, and, and showed that even as early as eight weeks, the epigenetic aging had 
significantly slowed down by about one and a half years. Wow. So, yeah. So that's now whether that was only a preliminary study and it's very new, whether or not that can be sustained or not over a period of time, uh, we, we don't know yet. But it, I think it's it's very it's really interesting that there's hard science now to support inclusion of that. And I did mention um, it, the nutraceuticals that they used, the omega oils, omega uh, threes and um, zinc, vitamin C, D and E. Certainly um, vitamin D in Ireland at this time of the year, we yep. should be taking vitamin yep. D. And there's actually very good early research now from Exeter suggesting uh, they looked at very large populations in the USA where um, vitamin D data was available, as well as really good brain function data, and showed that people who had high vitamin D levels were, well, rather, who showed that people who were deficient in vitamin D were 125% more likely to develop dementia. Why? Wow. time. So, so this is this is very really hot off the press stuff, but it's not just therefore that vitamin D is good for our bones. Maybe we know it is good for bones, but it could be that it's for, useful for brain health as well. And it's because there are very dense vitamin D receptors at the front of the brain in the prefrontal cortex, um, and it would and that's the area of the brain where we process. Uh, a lot of information so you lose nothing by having good vitamin d stores and i certainly take vitamin d and um, and we know that half of people in ireland over the age of 50 are deficient at this time of year wow. in vitamin d. yeah we just don't get enough when we get older um our skin isn't as good at metabolizing mm -hmm. vitamin d so that's the first thing and secondly we get we do not get adequate sun exposure at this time of the year, most of us anyway. <laughs> well, you know, so, and even, even the short term sun holiday doesn't deliver that long term, that kind of exposed dose of vitamin D that people need. So it, every time and time again, all the dietitians tell us when they come in, vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D, we just have to take yeah. it. Well, particularly for aging, I would yeah. say, you know, if you want, and you'd be amazed at the number of organs in our body that have vitamin D receptors. And the logical conclusion there is, well, if they have them, they must be serving a purpose. As we've evolved, we've evolved needing these receptors. Therefore, we should um, we should ensure that our levels are normal. So, so um, there 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 are two uh, elements to this. The vitamin D recommendations for bone are around. I use international units, so that just so you are aware of that are around four hundred IU international units to sustain good bone health. But for immunity and for inflammation that we're talking about and for dementia, it's much, much higher than that. So for the dementia study, they gave 4,000 international units. Now, that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty much an upper limit that we would recommend clinically. So I, I personally take 2,000 international units a day. And if people want yeah. to get their vitamin D levels checked, I, that presumably is a blood with a with your GP. Yeah, yeah? you yeah. can you can get a blood test for vitamin D, but you know, um, it's it's probably not necessary if you're taking vitamin D supplements. Take it anyway, <laughs> and it's quite expensive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So take it. So like, as ever, it's great to catch up. I love chatting to you because you just make you make everyone feel good and you give simple content. And like since the last time we spoke, I suppose to review the conversation, it is eating really, really well, that Mediterranean type diet. It is exercising. It is, you know, getting better at any age profile is going to improve your chances of aging. There is lots of science coming around, some of the blood transfusion concepts that we talked about and the epigenetics, but also for anyone listening in, any small step they make towards their health and their aging today will pay benefits in the future future and the final thing i'd like to add to that is sort of new over the last year since we last spoke carl is how bad sitting down is for us we should be doing this standing up yeah so you, we shouldn't sit for more than an hour at a time and then you and it's not just enough to stand up you need to stand up and move around and we know that sitting is bad for chronic inflammatory processes that's the recent work that's been done sitting for an hour really just, uh, accelerates uh, chronic inflammation, a background inflammation. So to get up and move around after an hour is important. It's fantastic to catch up. If people want to get in touch with you or find all the uh, research that you've done, can you tell us where they can do that? I, I, I'm, I'm on Twitter. 
So that's that's one way. And then uh, uh, the TILDA website, we, we update that all of the time with our, our new research and that of the colleagues we collaborate with, tilde.ie. Amazing. As ever, keep up the amazing work. I love to see you out promoting health and aging. So fair play to you for all the work that you do. And we'll catch up in person very, very soon. Folks, that's it for another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Lots of takeaways from it, all about aging and how to be healthy. We will see you next week for more Real Health. I'll see you then. Sláinte